The Commentary Booth is a show for media lovers by media lovers just like you. If you want to support the show, go to jamyapsmedia.com. Welcome to The Commentary Booth, the ultimate weekly entertainment recap and review show. My name is Jamie Apps, and each week I'll be joined by a rotating cast of co-hosts to run you through the entertainment media we've consumed during the week. Along the way, we'll provide you with insightful commentary and reviews. This week I'm joined by a teacher and travel blogger who lists their favourite movie as Fight Club and favourite TV show as Survivor. Welcome back to the show, Buddy McClellan. Thank you for having me back. Still still rocking the Survivor as a favourite TV show? Nothing's changed? I was just thinking that I wanted to change that, especially after The Bachelor with um, like Lockie. I just feel like he's really let the Survivor people down. Um, I had got really stuck watching Band of Brothers again for like the millionth time, and I thought, you know what, that's got so much more actual depth and quality to it, and Survivor just makes me sound like a reality TV junkie. It definitely does, but yes, Band of <laughs> Brothers is an incredible show. I will let you change yeah. it to that. Yeah, let's update. Yeah, let me update that now so that next time you don't sound ridiculous. Look, I am trashy. I'm just not that trashy. <laughs> for a second there, I thought you were going to change to The Bachelor. and I was really concerned for you. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'm definitely not that trashy. <laughs> uh, how was how's your weekend and the last few weeks been? Uh, it was good. I don't know if you saw what happened to me yesterday, though. I am... Um... I had a spider go into my wardrobe as I watched it. Like it was one of those real quick little, I think it was like a baby huntsman. And it went like full speed into my wardrobe. And that is just nightmare fuel. Especially, yeah, if you don't know where it is in the wardrobe, did you end up finding it? Uh, I, after like a good couple of hours of just full all out panic. Just, just shut the cupboard and left it? <laughs> yeah, I resided myself to these are the clothes that I wear now. The spider is just living there. It owns that part of the house. Let's just leave him be. So you you just left it there? You didn't end up looking for it later? I ended up looking like later because I was like, no, I can't just... I was in pyjamas at that point. Like I can't just wear boxes just around to go work or whatever. So I uh, ended up having to go digging for it and I found it hidden away uh, in some stuff at the bottom of a wardrobe. And I was very, very thankful that it got out because otherwise it was is either leave, let him live there or burn the house down. Yeah, probably not the best idea in a rental. Probably not the best idea, no, but it's, that's a landlord problem. <laughs> that's a landlord problem if you burn the house down. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you went away on the weekend as well. How was that? Yeah, it was good. We um we were supposed to have our wedding day. It was supposed to be 10-10-2020, October 10th. Um. Obviously, with COVID, that got moved. So it was really nice that our a few of our friends and mostly our bridal party um, decided that we should go away and do like a, an op shop pretend wedding. So we rented a house down the coast, like a really nice big house with a pool and everything. And we did like an op shop wedding, which was really fun until the next day where I wore like everyone had op shop clothes. I had um, like op shop bow tie and I was wearing joggers with a suit, which was our mate Cameron's year 10 formal suit, which I had as my year 12 formal suit. So it's a good 16 year old suit, which is kind of sad that it still fits me pretty perfectly. Like I really never grew. <laughs> Hit year 12 and then just stopped. Yeah. Well, I don't think I have any years. I think I year eight and just stopped probably. But <laughs> um, I wore that and then Anne wore a, like a op shop wedding dress and everyone looks super tacky. And it was fun. But then the next morning, I woke up to probably a good five different like DMs and inboxes of like, congratulations, mate, like so happy for you. And people thought we actually got married in front of a colorbond fence wearing op shop clothes and joggers. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> so people really do think I'm that tacky. Yeah, people thought that was sure. Like I saw that and was like, oh yeah, that's definitely a joke. Like there's joggers. Like, not a chance Anne's letting you get married in joggers. No. <laughs> or that dress she had on. Or that dress she had on, but so many people thought that was legit, and thank you to all those people for really caring about our, our wedding, but you've still got 
a good six months to wait for the real thing. Did you go down there for that um, wine festival as well? Yeah, well, originally it was going to be the tied in date. It gave us something else to do because I think for for so much of this year, like everything else has been just trying to find a good positive distraction. Um, so that was going to be our positive distraction was to go to the wine festival. Then the wine festival got cancelled as well. Oh. So we ended up just spending the extra money, changed the the plan with a, well, you originally going to get a not quite as nice of a house, but decided in the end to change to a nicer house and then went to a winery anyway. So we basically had our own wine festival down at, at Cupid's Winery. So yeah, we still made the most of it. Yeah, nice. The hard thing was it was a really nice weekend. So part of me was really happy. We got a nice weekend to go away. But in the background, you're always thinking, oh, we would have had perfect weather. We'll see how the, the weather goes for the next the next day that we booked. Yeah, it's hard not to get that thought of we should have been getting married on this beautiful day. Like the weather this weekend was awesome. Yeah. And someone took our day at the venue too. So we've got them on Instagram, obviously. So that was another hard thing to watch other people get married on the day until we saw they had seats at the ceremony that were um, socially distanced ceremony seats. It was like little pods of two seats kind of scattered around the aisle. Uh, okay, yeah, it was like the people that came together had to sit together and then it was just scattered. Yeah, really scattered. So it kind of it just didn't look right and it wouldn't have felt right. So I think we made the right decision in the end, um, but obviously still difficult because that's not what the uh, the plan was a year ago. But well, yeah, I think the best of this year is making the most of the situations that come up. And I definitely think we made the most of the weekend we had. Nice, nice and hungover the next day. Oh well, yeah, <laughs> it was op shop wedding uh, into wine tasting on a hangover. Which Ooh. I'm only pretty new to wine, so it was yeah going through the ones that you don't like. Like for me, I'm not really like a rosé drinker and things like that. And pretending that you were sipping and enjoying it in front of the the people that make the wines was a bit of a challenge. But it was nice to be outside in the sun. They had a really good um, ordering system too. I don't know if you've been anywhere that has that tap system on the um the actual table uh when i went to outback a few weeks ago they've got that now where you just scan the qr code yeah it tells you what table number you are and you just put in your stuff and it they just bring the food out to you that's fantastic i loved it i probably ordered more things because of it you actually didn't have to constantly wait for a waiter to come over and be like oh is there anything you want yeah i didn't have that awkward like trying to make eye contact like throwing out a high five and getting denied feeling where you're trying to look at the waiter and they never look back at you. It's just kind of tap it and they bring it. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. I I think there's going to be a few things from COVID that end up sticking around with stuff like that. And just, just the idea of checking into restaurants so that if something does happen, like someone gets sick, they could just easily let people know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of it's really good, but again, that, that menu thing, like the, the tap thing, is really great and really convenient, but then makes you think, okay, I wonder how many waiters, waitresses they're going to lay off because you're now being replaced by a phone and a tap thing. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, they'll only need people to just run the stuff out. They don't actually need people to wait every table, basically. Yeah, and none of the skill of being able to remember what's on the menu and talk to people about it. Yeah, they can probably just cut back their staff that way. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be an interesting evolution post-COVID. Well, if anyone wants a job as a spider hunter, you're more than welcome to come to my house and do it because I hated it. Yeah, I can't imagine Anne was good at that either. I'm assuming she was in the <laughs> same boat of, yep, that, that wardrobe is dead now. Stood down the hallway and threw the can of Mortine to me. Oh, thanks, Anne. Really helpful. <laughs> yeah, if anyone sees me in the next couple of weeks, I, I swear I don't always smell like toxic Mortine, but it was the safest option was to spray it and see what came out. <laughs> Just completely fill the room. Yeah. <laughs> filled the wardrobe <laughs> yeah this weekend i spent time down in your old haunt down the basin down the old down the basin and hey, god's country it was it was nice apart from the ridiculous amount of people that were around the joys the joys of school holidays yeah and the joys of covid school holidays because all those people would normally fly somewhere and do different things so yeah everywhere's really booked up yeah it was nice though just Went to Husky, had lunch and stuff, walked along the beach, just chilled in nice weather for a change. Did you see any whales? 
No. No. Saw a lot of smoke from back burning, which I'm glad they're doing this year. Yeah. Well, they lost control of it a bit down there too. They had um, Kararong caught on fire for a little while. So it's like they've got to manage that back burning. The back burn we saw was like right at the back of houses. And I was like, that would really concern me if I lived in those houses. Yeah, it, driving down to, to Ulladulla and Milton, and we actually went all the way down to um, Tilba and stayed down in a glamping little situation the night before, just the two of us. But the whole way down the coast from the fires last year, everything is still kind of just, you know, and the trees are like black sticks with just little furry bits of like a few leaves popping out. They look furry, but it's little green leaves. Yeah, it's it's such a weird look there. Weird. Black trunks with green bits sticking out. It's like, what? Yeah, but phenomenal. Like you can see where the houses are and everything around them is just completely just black sticks with green leaves. And the house is just still there. Like the, the way the firefighters can protect those houses and that more weren't lost, it's just crazy, crazy. So outside of your travels, have you been able to check anything out? Yeah, I've... Well, we've had a couple of the weeks of school holidays, so we've been sitting at home and watching a few things. Um, speaking on travels, I did. Have you ever seen Travels with My Father? It's the Jack Whitehall and Michael Whitehall um, travel show. It's like a comedy travel show. Uh, so I haven't watched it, but I interviewed Jack before he came out for his last tour, which is what this show ended up turning in, being turned in from. And what do you think of him off the, the interview? He was good. He's very funny. Yeah, I, I love him. And he sounds like he has a really good connection with his dad. He does, yeah. Well, and, you know, it's a funny connection. So his dad, Michael, um, was one of London's biggest um, like talent theatre agents. So I don't know if that's how he kind of started into his, his run on the stage. But um, they've now done four seasons of Travels With My Father. So... Lucky would have been telling you that last season he was in Australia on the back of um, promoting his comedy tour. Um, But that was season four. So they started originally, and I didn't even know Jack Whitehall as a comedian until Travels With My Father, the original one, came out. Um, And that was season one of them doing like a a gap year in Southeast Asia. Yep. And I I don't know if you've travelled much to Southeast Asia, but like in my experience of traveling, like Asian countries just tend to give you really good experiences, but generally the biggest culture shock. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's definitely like nothing like what we see. Totally different. No. And like, so Michael Whitehall, if you can imagine very proper um, and like to the point where Jack still calls his parents, he's, I think he's our age, like, early 30s he calls his parents mummy and daddy so his dad is super proper um like old british and he takes him on a gap year and like immediately puts him into a backpackers hostel in bunks and just basically tries to make his life hell and as uncomfortable as possible yeah 100 percent, and films it as they go and they're just it's hilarious and so the series one was southeast asia um series two they went in to do a european road trip series three they did usa and series four was australia um and it's funny to watch them evolve like almost as a comedy duo like they the comedy is mostly based around them just after i think what when michael realized what jack was doing to him he thought the best form of defense is a good offense so it's basically the two of them traveling around experiencing a bunch of things but just trying to embarrass the living crap out of the other person the whole time yep so something you would do to your mum or dad yeah well, i mean if you were filming it probably not the whole time because i guess at least they know with the cameras there they're doing it for a reason but man it, it's funny and i think to, in the end uh, michael whitehall has just received this cult following over it even to the point where when he was in um I can't remember if it was one of the European or the Asian countries, but he got like a, a doll. It's like a child doll and he named it Winston. And it's it's really, really like creepy looking child doll, like realistic skin, hair, everything. Ooh. And he dresses it in toddler clothes and he carries it with him everywhere like it's a living child. And he calls it Winnie or Winston. And um, even now I follow Winston on Instagram. <laughs> Good. 
like and just some of the inside jokes and things that they do with each other are, are really really funny and i mean like i've always been a, a massive fan of of travel shows like when we we're growing up i'd watch getaway and sydney weekender and all the rest of it and then i think hamish and andy like they did their gap year and all those shows which i i think are quite similar like they travel and you get to see these really good fun experiences that you could go on and places that you might not have thought would be fun to go um but then they do it with that mix of comedy in there as well yeah that comedy adds an extra level to it it's not just a visually appealing show it's also an enjoyable show in terms of the content because it's funny yeah and i almost find that i think with comedy they're looking for the weird moments like they're looking for the the silly things that happen or the in our case like this season four if there's like this they always seem to find the most bogan australians in some places um but they're honest about it because they think it's funny so you're not always just shown like the the prim proper like best possible case scenario version they just show you the honest version of what's happening and which i find refreshing as well because you can get a, a good understanding through the comedy of what the experience is probably like yeah and i suppose they sort of find like yeah they're probably going to hit the main spots like bondi and the gold coast and stuff but i imagine they also hit some of those unusual places that you might not have even considered going to yeah we he doesn't do a big trip around Australia. I don't know if they had limitations or whatever. And that's probably the big downfall of the seasons as they've gone on. So season one started out as like a proper season of like eight episodes or whatever. Europe, I think, had maybe six episodes. And then as it went down and down, I think the USA season three was like three episodes. And the most recent series is only four episodes. Um, that's right, it's only two episodes. So it's, I don't even know if you can call it a season at that point. And, and Credit to them, it just leaves you wanting more. It shows you how good those two episodes are. But they only really did um, Sydney, Queensland, and Uluru. But, I mean, they, they did make the most of the, the places they were in. They did speed dating in Sydney, which is where they met some really interesting humans. Mm -hmm. They did. They went to the cricket and met Brett Lee, and Elise Perry was bowling bouncers at Jack uh, in the nets at the back of the SCG and at Michael, and they had a, a batting competition. Which is brave. I was like, I oh, cricket balls are freaking scary, man. And to have Elise Perry bowling them at you is pretty brave just to stand in front of it. Yeah, at least it wasn't Brett Lee. At least it wasn't Brett Lee, but I mean, you wait to see Elise Perry bowl them and then st still see how you feel. Yeah, she's still quick. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if like the reduced season was because rather than them coming here to do specifically for the show, they were coming here on the back of his tour. I wonder if that's why it was like limited in that way yeah it seems like a really good way to promote the tour but i mean in that case it's a bit hard because the season came out at the end of september when his tour would have already been done so it promoted it in reverse so i would have loved to have gone to it but i didn't really realize it was happening at the time yeah yeah i wonder if he had he probably during the show it was promoting hey we're filming for this yeah check out this when it comes out and I mean, the show would have such a cult following now. It seems as though if I went to a Jack Whitehall show and Michael Whitehall and Winston Whitehall, the little doll came out, that'd be the best part of the whole thing, seeing Michael come out. And in most of his Netflix specials now, because of this show, he has to pull him out. Yep. Yeah, really funny. They do like a bunch of random stuff. They do like a drag show and he forces him into it. And yeah, they come out with their own little drag queen names. And because he's so proper, the only queen that Michael will dress up as is the Queen of England. So he comes out fully dressed as the Queen of England and does a drag show. Yep, I'm sure the Queen loves, loves <laughs> hearing that people are dressing as her for drag. Yeah, uh, I mean, they meet some interesting people, do some interesting stuff. And overall, really funny. And yeah, I love a good travel show. So yeah, anything that mixes comedy and travel together. I found it really good, but like I said, the only issue is the two episodes. You, give, you definitely want more, and you run out. But there is a lot of Jack Whitehall stuff now on Netflix. Yeah, and that that is on Netflix too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So you got all four series of that, and then I think he has his stand up special. He even has like a Christmas special when Christmas rolls around in a couple of months that isn't bad as well. So yeah, if you've never watched Jack Whitehall, I think he's quite funny. Um, his dad is, like I said, funnier, but there's plenty to watch. Uh, for me, Netflix recently has been all about Cobra Kai. The Karate Kid. Yes. So it's a web series that was originally produced for YouTube Red, which is now turned into YouTube Premium. Yep. 
and then after season two, Netflix picked it up, and they've now renewed it for season three and four. Season three is due in January, um, and it's set 34 years after the original Karate Kid movie. But just to add that extra level, it actually welcomes back Ralph Macchio and William Zabka in their original roles as Daniel LaRusso and Johnny Lawrence. <laughs> so the actual old characters. Yeah, so they're like they're, they're, it's literally just a straight continuation of the story just 34 years later where Daniel is has now gone on to be this super successful car dealer based off his success in the the Karate Kid movie and then Johnny on the other hand having lost the All Valley tournament is sort of a down on his luck handyman until he decides that he wants to revive the Cobra Kai dojo and then that renews the rivalry between the two men what a redemption story like redemption of the uh the characters and redemption of the actors really I haven't seen Ralph Maggio in anything other than like a cameo on um how I met your mother just as himself in 30 years yeah and the same with William Zabka like he hasn't really been in anything since Karate Kid I guess and I really like this show because it is obviously it follows on the Karate Kid it's it's all those nostalgia points but it twists it in just a way because it focuses more on Johnny as the central character and by doing that it lets you look at the Karate Kid movie from the opposite perspective so you're looking at it as from the bad guy's perspective when really he views Daniel as the person that ruined his life and he's the bad guy. And the the fun part is like when they – Johnny renews Cobra Kai, uh, Daniel reopens Miyagi-Do, and then you see the next generation of kids. So you have Robbie Keane who – is actually Johnny's son. He starts learning karate under Daniel. Samantha LaRusso, who's Daniel's daughter, she's learning under him as well. Then you have Miguel Diaz, who's a totally new character, and Hawk, another totally new character, learning under Johnny. And then they, in season two, the rivalry between the two dojos sort of takes more of a focus. It's not so much about the two main characters from Karate Kid it's now about this new generation of kids and their rivalry based on where they're learning yeah season two also has John Kreese the old sensei from Cobra Kai come back and then that obviously Johnny is sort of trying when he brings Cobra Kai back he wants to bring it back in the correct way he wants to teach respect and show that going down the path he went obviously doesn't lead to good outcomes. So he wants to sort of have these kids come in and learn karate the correct way and still fight hard, strike first, (laughs) but do it. Have some mercy in the end. You don't have to destroy people just for the sake of a victory. (laughs) Does it strike first, strike hard? Yes. (laughs) No mercy. That's the the end of that. So he's sort of dropped the no mercy part to just once the fight's over, it's over. But each episode's only 30 minutes, so it's a super (laughs) easy watch and it's just a really fun show that has obviously been super successful because it was the most streamed show on Netflix in September. Yeah, well, I keep seeing it, but I haven't really got myself to watch it yet. I was just – I didn't trust that it was going to be something that would redeem – Karate Kid. I guess all the other Karate Kid iterations haven't been super amazing. So yeah, I'm, I'm interested in this one. Yeah, like the um, what was it the Jaden Smith Karate Kid was a bit of a so Jaden Smith. Like it was okay, but it was just a yeah, knockoff. Yeah, it didn't feel like a proper Karate Kid. It was just a karate movie that used the name basically. Yeah, and I really love to see um the original characters like go at it again so you'd have um the two the cobra kai and um ralph maggio go ahead at, at it at, at 50 or whatever years old like have have the recreation of them going karate fight but middle-aged man version 
just try and stand on one leg to do the crane kick and see if your back holds out. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like that's where it's it's heading in either season three or four. It's going to build to them eventually being like, right, we've got to go at this again. Yeah. <laughs> just have the Voltaren ready afterwards. Yeah. And obviously, like, because it was produced for YouTube originally, I had similar feelings as you where I was like, is this going to actually be any good or is it just going to be some trashy YouTube show that dies away really quickly but it it hasn't people seem to love it I really enjoyed it and it's it like it hits all those beats that you want it to hit like this definitely feels like Karate Kid has cool action sequences has awesome music because it has the backing of Sony so Uh, I reckon check it out you'll probably enjoy it put that on the list Um, what else for you um, I have sticking with Netflix. I watched uh, with Anne actually the other night. We watched a film called The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. So that one was one of those films where you kind of you're doing a bit of digging around and going through the Netflix catalog, wondering what you want to watch out of a list of a million things, and you can't pick one. But it actually turned out to be a really wholesome, good story. So it's a, a 2019 film, but it's a true story from 2001. Uh, about a boy named William Kumkwamba who lived in a, a farming village in Malawi. And it follows him who he helps his family by fixing radios and, and doing a bit of farming. And it's a really poor sort of a town in Malawi, I think, where they make most of their money actually farming tobacco for tobacco companies. Uh, but it follows them through a really difficult farming season that they had which was combined with the 2001 September 11 terrorist attacks, which you don't really think about affecting countries outside of those sort of countries dragged into the war on terror or whatever. But the the economic crisis that it put a lot of the world through really heavily impacted them. And so that combined with um, the difficult farming season meant that a lot of their their village started to really go through a, a difficult time being able to find grain and food and they started to basically starve. So it follows William who he, he for his birthday, his family enroll him into school and he's super excited to go to school. But as this economic crisis comes through, his family being farmers, they can't afford to send him anymore. So the school basically without the money kick him out. But he keeps sneaking himself back into school and sneaks himself into the library to keep learning from the books that are in there, which as a school teacher, and even just as like we were at school as this was happening, probably roughly the same age as him, to be honest, just watching him sneak back into school and be so excited about his parents paying for school as a birthday gift for him, just really eye-opening to how lucky we are to be able to have free quality education with all the technology and and all the books and all the everything you could ever want. And we spend out most of our time trying to keep kids in the school or keep, even when we were younger, like not sneak out of the school or not be lazy. And this kid is sneaking in. Yeah. I was going to say like that. Imagine somebody being excited about getting to go to school as a birthday present. That's definitely not something that would happen here. No, it's insane. And like, it just really makes that link to them. Like he really just enjoys learning and like, I mean, our school's here now, it's that the, the fences on them to keep people out as well as in, I guess. Um, but it's just not, not the same for there. Like he's just really enjoyed learning. He had to try and con his parents into using more kerosene in their, their kerosene lamp so he could study in the nighttime for his tests. So he didn't have to try and study in the dark. Yep. Um, but when he keeps going back into the school, when he's sneaking in and as things are kind of taking that real bad turn, he finds a book on energy and starts reading about how windmills work and how electricity can be generated from windmills. And through his experience and and working through, like picking through junkyards and fixing people's radios, he comes up with the idea that if he can take the, the dynamo that powers a light on the bike, on the bike of his teacher, he could use that to then power a pump through a windmill to irrigate their farms. So basically as this whole country is collapsing and as all the people around him are starving and there's a bunch of this negative stuff going on he just doesn't give up on trying to help his family and 
he ends up making a windmill, like a full-size windmill out of a cut-up bike and some sort of scrap parts to power an old battery to an old pump and irrigates the farms of the local village. And as a 13-year-old boy in the middle of a, an economic downturn and sneaking into a school, saves the entire village and gets the farm crops to basically grow and feeds his family. Well, wow, that's actually super heartwarming by the sounds of it. Super, super uplifting and very, I guess it's a big reality check, which is, is probably nice at the moment that, again, you're sitting there at home thinking you feel, oh, I feel so sorry for myself because I'm not allowed outside and here you are with delivery at your fingers and, and all the rest of it. And meanwhile, there's people in other countries that are just trying to get grain to eat just basic foods and just stay alive. And yeah, super, super heartwarming. I mean, it's a bit slow moving at times. Yep. As you can imagine, when it's just a story about a kid really going to school and trying to survive. It's very eye-opening, a little bit slow moving at times, but in the end, like incredibly wholesome. And you you see at the end, it has, I really love those true stories where it has at the end, it shows you the photos and the, it gives you the bit of the story at the end about the actual person themselves. Yeah, and like where they are now type thing. Yeah, so he ended up... Um, being able to build more of those windmills for more of the farms around him, which then turned into him getting a scholarship and eventually um, moving across to get his degree on a full scholarship in the United States. Wow. So he pulled out of the village for doing that. He wrote a book um, about this with the, the assistance of somebody else, which was then turned into this film. So, I mean, digging through the uh, the Netflix back catalogue, and, yeah, that was a, a really uplifting, really nice eye-opening story and a real reality check of I guess what people can do if you've got a bit of purpose and you've got a bit of effort and like people are trying to get out of school and stuff here and yeah if you you can concentrate and this guy had a second-hand book and saved a whole town so yeah really nice story and yeah really recommend that one yeah the the digging through Netflix actually paid off this time you didn't settle on something that was a dud yeah we didn't and thankfully because a lot of the time I think you can settle on oh that looks kind of funny yeah, that'll that'll do. <laughs> yeah, just what do they even have the category like irreverent comedy or whatever it is? And it's just like, oh, okay, we could probably do that, but this time, yeah, it was it was very very uplifting. Yeah, and when you're talking about this, the fences on schools, yeah, driving past um, Vin Senior High on the weekend, I was like, yeah, that definitely looks like a prison now. Well, Vin Senior High was actually a yeah, little local fun fact for you. It was actually designed by somebody that designed prisons. Really? Yeah. Well, that's that's, that's the, the local story. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, all the schools have those fences now. It's not the little silver fence like it used to be. Yeah, now they're all big 10-foot <laughs> high fences. Yeah. And, I mean, I've seen kids get out of those anyway. I've seen, we used to have a kid that um that managed to dig his way out under it. It's like um the great escape. That's a determined child. Yeah, made it. <laughs> hey, if you if if you can dig out under the fence, you deserve to go in. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, no, I had to go. Disclaim, I had to go and get him. But um, he yeah, those fences you could you could say for keeping people out as well. I mean, you don't want random people sneaking into schools, and there's already enough damage gets done to schools here on the weekend just for for vandalism. But yeah, I mean, respect the schools and respect the process and. And you can make some big changes like um, William Kumquamba. And then I I checked out another sort of pretty heartwarming movie this weekend after finally having my arm twisted and into watching The Notebook. The romance is real. Yeah. I, <laughs> of, it was it. Uh, full disclaimer, I didn't choose it. I was It was chosen for me, but... You don't have to lie to everyone. It was actually... It wasn't as bad as I was expecting. It's a good movie. It's a, it's a bit cliched now as like the Netflix and chill movie, but it is a, it's not a bad movie. Yeah, I can definitely see like why it's developed that sort of cult following and had such longevity. Like It's released in 2004 and people still talk about, oh, let's watch no- The Notebook. Like, I can't think of many 2004 movies that people still go back and watch like that. Yeah, not really, yeah. Did you feel all loved up at the end? Oh, uh, I suppose a little bit. The twist is, if you can call it a twist, is like super obvious from the start. Sometimes that's nice. Did you find that as well? Like the twist is not 
surprising at all. It seems super telegraphed from the very beginning. Yeah, but sometimes that's a nice thing. You you always have to have a big twist that's come in and surprises you. Sometimes it's nice to just know that people end up in love and everything works out. I like my M. Night Shyamalan crazy mind-blowing twists though. (laughs) I was only listening to the uh, Hamish and Andy episode yesterday where they had... um, they they got told by M Night Shyamalan that twenty years is the uh, the limit on movie twists. So they put an alarm in their phone, and twenty years after the uh, Sixth Sense was released, they started ringing people to give away the twist because M Night Shyamalan gave them the green light. <laughs> so, so I guess you got a lot. It came out in two thousand and four. You got another four years, and you can start giving the Notebook twist away, even though it's already given away. Yeah, I think I think most people know the Notebook. 99% of people have been roped into watching The Notebook like I was. It roped in. I don't believe that for a second. It was roped in and it was worth it. <laughs> but um, in doing research, like that movie has generated a crazy amount of income. It had a budget of $29 million and it's since earned 116.1. Wow. Yeah. Well played, The Notebook producers quality profit on that one do they get paid so that's beyond like when it comes out at the movies like do they get paid every time it's played on a streaming service or whatever or they get paid just to have it on there yeah they probably just get a a license fee at the beginning for a set period and then if it gets renewed they'd get another bump on top of that um they'd get a percentage of dvd and blu-ray sales as well because i'm Going to assume it has been redone in a Blu-ray format. Oh, once you got that cult following, it's not going anywhere now. Yeah, it's currently sits at the fifteenth highest grossing romance movie of all time. What's number one? I would love to know what's number one. I don't know. I didn't check that. I should have. Next time I want to know what's the most romantic movie ever made. Highest grossing romantic movie. Let's see what comes up. Oh well, duh. Titanic. Yeah, didn't need to Google that one. Oh, nailed it. <laughs> oh, $2.19 billion. Billion? Yep. You could build a whole new Titanic for that. Yep. You could build a few two, few Titanics. One goes down, just get the next one. Okay, here's a here's a good quiz for you. What was number two? Oh, I want to go something old school. Number two. I'm going to say The Bodyguard. Nope. We already know. I lost trivia. We know. (laughs) The 2017 version of Beauty and the Beast. What? Which was apparently terrible. That's outrageous. Yep. That should not be above some other films. 1.26 billion? Billion. Yep. That's just because it had Beauty and the Beast in the name and everyone went for it. Yeah. And um, Emma Watson. And Emma Watson in the cast. Yeah. The Beast looked weird. Yes. Number three is probably another shocker as well. It is Aladdin from 2019. Okay, I wouldn't call it romance, but massive Aladdin fan, so not upset with that. Have you seen the live-action version of Aladdin? Yeah, I wasn't overly impressed, but I wasn't overly unimpressed because I was, like, huge, huge. I still have, like, pyjama pants with the genie on them from Peter Alexander now as an adult, so... I'm a massive Aladdin fan, um, and I wasn't too disappointed. But I, I don't know how they're getting all this money. It's just as soon as it's a Disney thing. Yeah, it got it got one point zero five billion. Yeah, number four is a good one. Number four, oh, actually, maybe not. It's Shrek two, not Shrek. <laughs> what? What? Nine hundred and twenty-eight oh, million. There's such a difference between Titanic and Shrek two. Mm-hmm. Like it's the love between a donkey and a dragon. Uh, number oh god number five is the twilight saga breaking dawn part two team jacob team okay i haven't seen twilight i'm assuming i'll get roped into (laughs) that soon that'll be the next thing you do uh number six is twilight saga breaking dawn part one team jacob again number seven is twilight new moon holy dolly twilight (laughs) you got a lot of viewing ahead of you Number eight, Twilight Eclipse. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Forrest Gump. Okay, they're, they're, this is a very loose romance list. Yeah, it's a very strange list. Mamma Mia. 
<laughs> a weird list. Who'd have thought? You get all loved up watching The Notebook one time, and look, we're on to the, uh, the list of all the best romance films there are. You're ready to go. Some of those I do not want to watch. I don't want to watch that Beauty and the Beast one. Aladdin, I would... Yeah, okay. I don't want to sit through all the Twilights, but... You can't say, like, imagine if you're like, okay, sweetheart, I've made this really romantic dinner, and then we're going to watch a romantic film, and all of a sudden Shrek 2 comes on. Yeah, I can't imagine that would go down well. <laughs> they just romantic. look at you like, what are you doing? How did you choose this? <laughs> uh, oh, well. Uh, and there was one other thing on your list? Yeah, uh, I don't want to sound like a broken record with the Amazon Prime's uh, like all or nothing style sports shows, but I finally got one that has a happy ending. Um, they have one, it's not called All or Nothing, still Amazon Prime, but it's um, Take Us Home, which is the Leeds United version, so Leeds United Football Soccer Club, which a lot of Australians would probably remember because if you're ever playing soccer back in the day, it was this, the club that Harry Kuehl and Mark Viduka played a lot of their careers at. Yep. And it follows them through the last season of the champ, the last two seasons actually of the championship. So not the English Premier League, like the top rung of football, the second below that. And like it's really good. I'd say I'd rate it better than the um the All or Nothing series. It's a big call coming from you. Yeah, it is. And I think it's because the championship just naturally, if you're a, like a real big soccer football uh, watcher, you kind of know that the championship's a bit better viewing already because it doesn't have necessarily have the best players in the world, but it definitely has teams that are more desperate to not get relegated again and just drop off the face of the planet. As a result of that, it seems that there's more goals and more big goals. Their seasons seem to have more games. And when you're talking about money, when they win the championship and get promoted to the EPL, it's the most, most lucrative prize in world sport. So it's 170 million pounds, which translates to $306 million Australian when they get promoted. Jesus. So, I mean, the teams and the clubs and the towns and the, the cities that they're in are all just so passionate and so desperate to get them promoted. And I mean, Leeds United was a very, very big club sort of back in the, the early 2000s, sort of late 90s, whatever, when Cure was going around. Um, but they made some really bad transfer moves and had to end up selling off a lot of people. Like Harry Cure got sold off, I think went to Liverpool. So they started to to get this guy back in that bought the club who made some really big purchases. And interestingly enough, and kind of in a, in a, or a bit of a reflection of the Tottenham Hotspur season, they spent most of their money on... Um, on a really good coach and they got uh, Marcelo Bielsa who was a coach that I hadn't really heard much about but then when you start to see him coach the side and the way he plays uh, he actually has his own system of football named after him it's called the Bielsa Press which is basically his teams he just gets them so fit that they press which is where the ball's in the back end of the your opposition's half you just go at them and at them and at them until they eventually make a mistake his team's press for 90 minutes. The whole entire game they press, which... Is unusual. It is. If you've ever seen how much a soccer player runs, to run extra and run extra hard for all of that time, like it's an hour and a half plus stoppage time of hard running, and it works for them. They they jag a lot of goals in the ends of games and they turn a lot of results that shouldn't be theirs because they just have just such unrelenting pressure. Um, but it follows that in that like it's a hard system because you're more likely to get injuries. Obviously, the harder you work, the more chance there is that something's going to probably give up, like a hamstring or whatever. But it really follows like an honest look at the the club and a team that are, are loyal to their club, that enjoy playing together, that are loyal to their city. They've got players like Calvin Phillips who gets offered a lot of money and basically could be playing for, for England when his team's in the championship. But unless he's playing in the EPL, that's not going to be a reality for him. Yeah, that sucks. Well, he was a kid that grew up in Leeds and he refuses to leave the club and is so sure that they can get promoted again that he stays with them. And if you follow the EPL now, you'll see that two seasons later, they got promoted. And so you get to finally get that happy story that I think all or nothing has just been waiting for. They keep embedding themselves with teams in the top leagues, hoping for a fairy tale, and it just yep. never seems to happen. That's um a very unusual thing to hear in professional sport these days somebody that's just 
that tied to the club emotionally that they're not going to go for greater accolades or for the extra cash. Exactly. I mean, he is, he'd be their top paid player. He's still not going to be struggling for money, put it that way, especially not now that they got promoted and he was right to stay with them. But just it's a group of players that you can see that it must be really hard for those guys that you never really think when you hear someone getting sold or whatever else, they have to move countries. And they there's guys that have been there for sort of eight years and only ever played together or whatever, and they get sold and have to go play somewhere else as the team starts to become successful. But it's a really honest look at them and credit to them as players. Like a lot of their their players, like their captain, um, their right back Ailing, he is really honest. As they're starting to get promoted, he sits there and he's like, look, I've just always dreamt of this. To be honest with you, I never thought that I'd be able to get myself out of the championship and play in the top league because I just hope that I can do well and I hope that I can make my family proud. And he's like, they're honest about how much their parents and their families put in for them. And it's just, the championship seems to have so much less arrogance and so much more on the line that I think it just makes it a better show. Is I imagine the championship, because they don't have the heavy weights of United and City spending ridiculous amounts, it's more even across the board too. Yeah, and they have financial fair play rules in there as well, I think, where they can't just overload sides which is in the end why they have to sell a couple of their players and make some moves. But, yeah, very, very competitive. But it's really nice. And you see like, the Leeds fans are just – like I, I feel like every time I watch a, a sports show, the fans are super loyal and very intense. But these people are probably taking the cake. Yeah, Leeds fans, the few that I know are pretty diehard, take it to the next level. Yeah, and now like with them being back in the Premier League, they're, they're going pretty well. Like I think the last time I checked – they would have been sort of top 10 easy. I think that was six, something like that. They're getting some good results. I think they just had a draw with Liverpool. For a team that's just got promoted, they're they're going well. And that's what's really nice to see, especially after you've seen this show. If you watch it now, and now you can watch them on the weekends playing EPL, it's, and they've kept a lot of their players, so it makes it really exciting to watch. You feel like you kind of know them a little bit, which is, yeah, it's nice to watch. Yeah, that's good. Like Usually you'll see a team get promoted and half the team gets changed out. Yeah, which um, it isn't happening to them. Yeah, they're currently sitting eighth with two wins, a draw, and a loss. Yeah, I mean, that's a team that's got promoted from the championship, and they're only kind of below big sides. I mean, they're well above United and City. <laughs> Although both of those teams have a game in hand, but yeah, they're both way down there. They've both been playing pretty rubbish football. But yeah, definitely recommend that one as a sports show. I know that I've promoted a lot of sports shows that are very similar on this podcast. And to be fair, I've enjoyed pretty much all of them. But this one seems to be, at least you know, and like if you follow sport, you know you're going to get a happy ending out of this. Because a lot of those shows, especially when you're watching like the NFL ones or whatever, they tend to be an anti-climax because it's hard for a team to sort of get that fairy tale that I know those directors and those producers are after. Yeah, they're definitely hoping, leading into it like, this team's going to win. I guess, I think they have the same problem with um, the NFL. Every year do hard knocks, and they just pick a team to follow during preseason. Yeah. And they're always sort of hoping that that's going to be the year that that team breaks out and goes on to win the Super Bowl. But obviously you can't predict that stuff in sport. No. Like even today, there was a terrible injury in the NFL. Dak Prescott snapped his ankle. So. Yeah. That's the Cowboys season in tatters now, I assume. Yeah, well, see, the Cowboys were one of those all-or-nothing seasons with Dak Prescott, and it was a similar thing. They couldn't quite get there. So, I mean, if they're following them again, it's going to be the same sort of thing. It's going to be sad. Uh, And then, yeah, the last couple of things for me are I've been playing WWE Battlegrounds, which is the new game from WWE, but this year instead of delivering like a proper real life simulation game they've gone the more arcade cartoony route similar to like the nba street and nba playgrounds style yeah and it's developed by the same team that made nba playgrounds saber interactive published by 2k sports and yeah it's it's a fun like party game it's not one you're going to sit there and sink hours and hours into playing solo but it's just got this really fun gameplay loop where it's it's easy to pick up and play just as a silly fighting game. 
but then there's a bit more depth there if you want to sit there and dive into it more. But it's all about the art style, really. It's like this super fun, like, caricature style of all the, the characters. Yeah, like big heads. Yeah, big heads, like, ridiculous, like, body over muscles and stuff. Um, And it's the sort of style people have been clamoring for since the simulation games in the last few years have slowly been losing their luster because they're getting... Like, have you played the UFC games recently? Yeah, I was going to I am not a fan. I mean, we didn't we have it when we first lived together? We had the original one. It was fun. But then they just try and become too real. It's not fun. Like, you don't want to play a video game for that. They've got super technical, and it's the same with the WWE games. They've got crazy technical that they've sort of become too hard for beginners to get into. Yeah. Well, it's like, at what point does it stop being a game and just start being a simulator? Yeah, so where this is like a fun, easy to pick up and everyone could have a go and has a chance of coming out on top. It doesn't have to be someone that's played hours and hours and hours. I think particularly with fighting games, you want that as well. Like almost it's like it's funny when it's like that, when it's cartoon based and a bit silly. Like Those old school games used to be like that, like Sega Soccer Slam and silly ones like that make it a lot more fun than just flat out violence. Yep, and... AEW have been promoting that they're making a game for their company as well, which they've said the inspiration is like the old school Sega WWF No Mercy games. So I'm hoping that they follow a similar vein to this and go the arcade. Easy to pick up. One of those ones that if you're having a heap of people over, like everyone can pick it up and have a go and not feel like they're just going to get trounced by the person that owns it and has played hours. Yeah. Is it old school characters? In the Battlegrounds one, yeah, there's yeah. like old school Undertaker, old school Stone Cold, uh, the Rock's in there, and then they mix in with the newer guys. There's a lot of like microtransactions though where they try and encourage you to spend a bit of extra money and get this variant of characters which always feels gross, especially when it's just a variant of someone. Yeah, it's not just spending the money for a game anymore, is it? Like, that's the the hard thing with things being convenient, is that it's also convenient for them to try and get extra money out of you. Yep. That's why I'm always super excited when a game comes out before they release them. Like, either we're going to, after the game releases, we're going to do these three DLC packs. If you want them, you can get them. Or even better, if they come out and go, There's not going to be any microtransactions, no DLC. This is just pay for this. This is what you get, like similar to what they did with Tony Hawk. Like this is what's available. Have at it. Yeah. Uh, And then the last thing, I finished season two of The Boys last night. You've been watching it as well? Yep, finished it last night. (laughs) Ah. What did you think of the season two? What a season. I didn't think they could make the boys season one any more violent and crazy and weirdly sexualized and they really proved me wrong Mm -hmm. i i think it's one of the best written shows that have been released in some time actually yeah i really like the i don't again you don't want to give away all the twists but i really enjoyed the twists that it had in it and I, i enjoy that they add those extra characters in there and that there's nods to the comic book when you look in the um the little X-ray vision, whatever they have on Amazon Prime, you can kind of see where they've done things that are, are nods to the comic book. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought it had a good ending. It's just crazy, absolutely crazy at times. <laughs> yeah, how wild is that ending scene? Yeah, <laughs> like wild. Yeah, just gross and funny and wild. And still, a massive shout out to all the uh, the human security teams that still just think. Maybe if I shoot one or two more bullets at the the superhero, that'll get him. (laughs) I don't get why you're shooting your gun there and standing there still. He has lasers for eyes. Yeah, just run. Get out of there. And he's bulletproof. Just run away. Yeah. But I think the way they took it into um, releasing the the Compound V and talking about how there could be extra soups made up and and that whole battle between the companies was really cool as well and and the church being involved. Yeah, the ending, yeah, obviously don't want to spoil it, but I'm excited for season three and 
given that sort of Homelander is off the rails now, so that'll be fun to see. Yeah, further off the rails. Yeah, even further than season one. <laughs> uh, and Jensen Ackles is joining the show next season as well, so that'll be interesting to see how he incorporates into the, the universe. Yeah, that will be interesting because it's Eric Kripke, isn't it? Is the um, he's like the Bobby Singer actor out of of Supernatural. Yes, because he makes some cameos in there every now and then. Yeah, yeah. So Ackles is coming in as Soldier Boy as another superhero. So it'll be like obviously not reading the comics. I'm not entirely sure what his character is about, but um, I enjoyed Jensen in Supernatural, so I'm keen to see him join the cast. Yeah, hundred percent agree. It'll be good. That's, that's, I'm excited that they've already got the next season greenlit and ready to go. I just I hate waiting again now. Yeah, now we've got the nice long wait again, and especially with COVID, it's probably all been delayed. So hopefully it's not. Hopefully we're not waiting twelve months. Hopefully it's early next year, but who knows? Yeah, bring it. I'm ready. The only thing, like I feel like the boys would be such a bigger phenomenon if it was on like a Netflix. Yeah, like yes, Amazon Prime is hugely popular now but like i don't even think it still is like i am out there and singing the praises of amazon prime not just on on the podcast like when i'm talking to people i feel like i'm always saying yeah i watch this great show and like you should definitely watch it they go oh yeah yeah what's it on i say amazon prime and they go oh no i don't have it and they're just like i think the word amazon to people just it has that that feeling of like a ebay shopping feel yeah that's true. So I think they 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 think it's all too hard to sign up and get it organised. But I mean, I definitely prefer watching Amazon Prime over Netflix most of the time. I I definitely prefer Amazon for movies. Yeah, and and I mean sports shows for me, like I keep talking about, they all seem to be on Amazon Prime. Like I know Netflix has a couple, like the the Drive to Survive, and it did a couple of the football shows and things like that. But all the best ones are on Amazon. I guess here where people don't really use. Amazon as much as like people in the US like people I know in the US pretty much use Amazon to get all their groceries and stuff delivered so like Amazon Prime makes a ton of sense for them it's the the streaming is essentially just a bonus to their free delivery and whatnot yeah it just hurts me the idea that people in Australia would be subscribed to something like Stan and not have Amazon Prime yeah Stan has the occasional thing that I'm keen on and another time most of the time it's like that's the that's the last resort for I need to find a movie or something to watch 100% so uh what would be a top recommendation for the week uh top recommendation sounds like it's a hard week it is a hard week everything was quite good I'd say I've already talked about the boys enough so if people aren't listening from that then I don't know what's going to get you but I would say I really enjoyed Travels with my father and I think if you are looking for something funny and you haven't started that, there's a lot of viewing of Jack and Michael and Winston Whitehall that I think was was really funny. So that would probably be my my top pick. Yep. And then for me, it is Cobra Kai, especially if you're a Karate Kid fan. This will hit all the notes that you want it to hit and an easy watch. Like, Like I said, half an hour, it's a fun one to just chuck on where you're eating dinner or chilling out in the afternoon after after work sounds good okay so thank you for listening to the commentary booth if you enjoyed the show please remember to rate review and subscribe you can follow me on social media at jamie apps media and you can follow buddy on instagram at a dot b underscore c s double e thanks for having me enjoy your twilight viewing yeah did you hear that about jackson's bloody challenge that he posted last week too no. So he's posed the challenge to us. If we get a thousand plays on the podcast by the end of November, I will get the logo tattooed on me in a location of my choosing. Ah, <laughs> uh, oh, still good. <laughs> I'm yes. still excited about that. And if we get to fifty subscribers on Patreon, where they get the early access to the show. I will get it on my right foot because I told Jackson how bad that hurt. So I wanted to make that milestone <laughs> very far away. Oh, <laughs> but look, if we hit that, it'll be totally worth it. I am going to promote this. I'm going to promote this like you wouldn't believe. 
as of last week, we were at 670 plays. So we had 330 to hit in three weeks. We can get there. That's that's all for this week. Thanks for joining me, buddy, and I'll talk to you in a few weeks. Sounds good. Get ready for that tattoo. Go Team Jacob. The Commentary Booth is a fan-funded production of Jamie Apps Media. You can support the podcast alongside our magazine, Jam Zine, over on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Media. The following people supported at the Jam publisher level or higher, and you cannot fathom how incredibly appreciative we are for their support. Brian and June Hart, Courtney Paulson, Tracy Apps. Yeah.